him by his contemporary Pliny. So he's got a pretty good background right there with Pliny. His full name is Caius Cornelius Tacitus. The date of his birth can only be arrived at by conjecture and then only approximately. The younger Pliny speaks of him as prope modem aquiles, under the same, about the same age. Okay, Pliny was born in 61. Tacitus, however, occupied the office of Cassator under Vespasian in 78 AD, at which time he must therefore have been at least 25 years of age. This would fix the date of his birth not later than 53 AD. It is probable, therefore, that Tacitus was Pliny senior by several years. Okay, that's enough. That's enough, sweet. <laughs> so those dates right there are important, 61 and 78. So in 61 and 78, this is probably 30 years after I want to say that Jerusalem, or that the Rome raised Jerusalem to the ground in about 30 AD after the revolt led by their, their figure, Jesus and those apostles. Rome simply raised it to the ground, burnt, just killed them all. Millions of, 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 uh, of Israelites killed. They simply couldn't deal with it. But this is also the time that this great transition is beginning to occur. And it's becoming problematic in the empire. Um, they're becoming more and more vociferous. They're becoming more and more radical. This was a time when a monk would stay in a cave for two or three years and then come out and he would meet a passerby on the road. And if they didn't worship the one true God, they felt fully justified in killing them. So there's a radical transition occurring here in the foundations of the faith of this empire. Coming from a pagan, it has got so bloated that it's allowed this cantorous idea to come in and in another, let's see, another 200 and so years, about the age of the United States, you will have Constantine and the Council of Nicaea. And then later on after that, you'll have Theodosius. So this is very much a time of change that Tacitus is writing this book about Germania. At this time, there are German um, cell swords, if you will, stop in the empire working in Constantinople and working in various places that uh, the Rome, Romans would use. They would take people from this area and they would send them to be in occupation in this area because they wouldn't have no loyalties there. They'd be far from home. Their only loyalty would be to the empire and they could enact great and terrible things in behalf of the empire against the people that were not their own. So when you look at this idea of of, um, of Christ being crucified on a cross, on a tree. The Gnostics referred to it as a tree of life, supposedly. Um, and being pierced in the side by a spear while soldiers cast lots for his garments. There's inadvertently a very powerful imagery of Germans, of Nordic, of Northern European tribes being a part of this gambling. Because if you'll, if you'll remember correctly, um, Gambling was one of the ways in which these northern tribes determined if they were living right, because that would mean luck is on their side. Luck was a very powerful thing. And if you were living right, doing the right thing, you had that luck. So they've inadvertently created this real odd scene that perhaps there were troops there. So the correlations run deep. This is that time of transition that Tacitus is writing this. His parentage is also a matter of pure conjecture. The name Cornelius was a common one among the Romans. So from that- Well, you so can log in and I'll just, it'll show them that- We can draw no inference. The fact that at an early age, he, the uh, fact that at an early age, he occupied a prominent public office indicates that he was born of a good family. So he's a crust kind of guy. And it is not impossible that his father was a certain Cornelius Tacitus, a Roman knight, who is a procurator at Belgic Gaul, with whom Pliny the Elder speaks of in his natural history. So there's some other evidence there. So from this one man uh, at Gaul, he's got a firsthand account of the Celtics, the Julius, the Celts that Julius Caesar spoke of, and Tacitus is on the other side of Northern Europe talking about these Germanic tribes. Of the early life of Tacitus and the training which he underwent preparatory to those literary efforts, which afterwards rendered him a conspicuous figure among Roman literatures, we know absolutely nothing about. You have to ask yourself, why would this one book propel him to be a conspicuous figure among, among Roman literatures? This is a big empire. This is a 
probably close to its height, if not far from it. And this man writes a book on Germania. And in Annals, his other book, he writes about the people that settled Israel. And he writes about a couple of other cultures, too. So those three books propel him to a conspicuous figure among Roman literatures. This is not an easy thing to do. They don't have uh, KDP. They don't have uh, Amazon. They have works of quality. They also have works which either subscribe to the national narrative or that cast blame at the national narrative, things that call into doubt the actions of the empires at the time. How would you do, how would you best challenge some of the narratives that are going on in an empire when the public forum is where most of the information is dispersed? Why you would compare it to a neighboring culture. And this is what Tacitus did with Germania. Most of his arguments here that he talks about call into question the nature of what Rome is becoming based upon the culture of what has heretofore been a most difficult set of people to, to uh, conquer. Indeed, they didn't finish it until the 13 or 1400s with the Holy Roman Empire conquest of uh, Lithuania, the last, pagan, the last crusade against paganism. <laughs> the events of his life which transpired after he attained man's estate, we know but little beyond that which he himself has recorded in his writings. He occupied a position of some prominence as a pleader at the Roman bar, so he was an attorney. Uh, that is not something to be dismissed either. So when we look at the writings of uh, Snorri, we have to remember that he also held a prominent legal position as the presiding judge of the all thing when he wrote these words. So this legal idea, these great legal minds with their penetrating thought process are also providing us with clear insight into what this is supposed to look like. <laughs> and in 77 AD, married the daughter of Julius Agricola, a humane and honorable citizen. So we have, once again, he stays with the upper crust who was at that time consul and was subsequently appointed governor of Britain, once again, at the forefront of the Roman Empire and very much in touch with pagan cultures. It is quite possible that this very advantageous alliance hastened his promotion to the office of Castor under Vespasian. Under Dalmatian, in 88, Tacitus was appointed, to one of 50, was appointed one of 15 commissioners to preside at the celebration of the secular games. In the same year, he held the office of Praetor and was a member of one of the most select of the old priestly colleges, in which a prerequisite of membership was that a man should be born of a good family. So right there is a real input into his idea, his understanding of pagan culture in and of itself being a member of this priestly college. He did not return to Rome until 93 after an absence of four years during which, oh, wait a minute, the following year, he appears to have left Rome, and it is possible that he visited Germany and there obtained his knowledge and information respecting the manners and customs of his people, which makes his work the sub that makes the subject of his work known as the Germany. He did not return to Rome until 93 after an absence of four years, during which time his father in law died. Sometime between the years of 93 and 97, he was elected to the Senate. So now he's a Roman senator. This man has moved up. And during his time witnessed the judicial murders of many of Rome's best citizens, which were perpetrated under the reign of Nero, the mad emperor. Being himself a senator, he felt that it was not, he was not entirely guiltless of the crimes which were committed. And in his Agricola, we find him giving expression to the feeling in his following words, our own hands dragged Helvidius to prison. Ourselves, we tortured with the spectacle of Morcus and Rusticus and sprinkled with the innocent blood of Senecio. In 97, he was elected to the councilship as successor to Virginius Rufus, who died during his term of office, and at, his, and at whose funeral, Tacitus delivered an oration in such a manner to cause Pliny to say, the good fortune of Virginius was crowned by having the most eloquent of panegyrists. In 99, Tacitus was appointed to the Senate together with Pliny to conduct the prosecution against a great political offender, Marius Priscus who as proconsul of Africa had corruptly mismanaged the affairs of his office. We have his associate's testimony that Tacitus made a most eloquent and dignified reply to the arguments 
which were urged on the part of the defense. The prosecution was successful and both Pliny and Testis were awarded a vote of thanks by the Senate for their imminent and effectual efforts in the management of the case. The exact date of Testis' death is not known, but in his annals, he seems to hint at the successful extension of the Emperor Trajan's Eastern campaigns during the years 115 to 117. So it is probable that he lived until the year 117. So at such a pivotal point, and what we now look at as a pivotal point in history, this man was a mover and shaker. He was not someone to be fooled with, born of a good family, respected by the priestly class, and, and the literary account of culture of that time. So he had a widespread reputation during his lifetime. Now, if we look at Rome during that time, for a man in today's world to have a widespread reputation, what kind of success must he enjoy? And here's a man that wrote about our ancestors and how they lived with what might be first perceived as some kind of disdain, uh, enjoyed quite a bit of success, high success in his own culture. <clears throat> so on one occasion is related to him that as he sat in the circus at the celebration of some games, a Roman knight asked him whether he was from Italy or the provinces. Tacitus answered, you know me from your reading, to which the knight quickly replied, are you then Tacitus or Pliny? To be on par with some measure of, of, of historical, a figure of such historical reference is no easy feat. It is also worthy of notice that the emperor Marcus Claudius Tacitus, who reigned during the third century, claimed to be descended from the historian and directed that 10 copies of his works should be published every year and placed in the public libraries. And that's important to remember because I've written a lot of books, a lot of people remember them, but none of us will remember what the New York Times bestseller was from 10 years ago. And yet here we have the support of an emperor saying, no, we're gonna keep this going. That's important to remember. Um, our, our lore is that it was put down to paper a thousand years ago. Um, and still here, affecting lives. That's an important thing to remember too. That's not something of, I would say, strictly human nature. That is something that means much, much more. Why is that story continuing to be told? Now there's something in it we need to hear, something that resonates with us. The list of the extant works of Tacitus is as follows. The Germany, the life of Agricola, the dialogue of orators, the histories and the annals. The following pages contain translations of the first two of these works, the Germany, the full title of which is Concerning the Situation, Manner, and Inhabitants of Germany contains little of value from a historical standpoint, but I disagree. It describes with vividness the fierce and independent nature of the German nations with many suggestions as to the dangers in which the empire stood of these people. So they were very much a threat. And we'll, so next it goes into the rest of his books, but I want to dive into this and see if we can get something going on Tacitus because that's what we're all here on. Germany is separated from Gaul, Raetia, Pannonia and by the rivers Rhine and Danube, from Sarmatia and Dacia by the mountains and mutual dread. <laughs> Means they all respect with each other. Mutual dread is no slight thing. It's a mutually assured destruction, kind of like, uh, hmm. Russia and the United States. The rest is surrounded by an ocean embracing broad promontories and vast insular tracts in which our military expeditions have lately discovered various nations and kingdoms. The Rhine issuing from the inaccessible and precipitous summit of the Raetic Alps bends gently to the west and falls into the northern ocean. The Danube poured from the easy and gently raised ridge of Mount Abnoba visits several nations in its course till at length it bursts out by six channels into the Pontic Sea. The seventh is lost in the marshes. So we have a physical description with which we can kind of determine what tribes he's really talking about. Some would suggest that it's the Suebi or the Suebi, uh, the Cheruski, uh, the, the, the peoples that, that populated Pomerania and the islands of Rugen, specifically when he talks about the, uh, the, the uh, sacrifices, he's, he's talking about the uh, Rugen for sure. The people of Germany appear to be indigenous and free from intermixture with foreigners, either as settlers or casual visitants. 
for the immigrants of former ages perform their expeditions not by land but by water. And that's an important thing to consider. These people weren't walking. So there's, there's a lot of skill, but by water in that immense, and if I may so call it, hostile ocean is rarely navigated by ships from our world. So that's an interesting statement in itself because that means that these people had some skill in navigation, uh, not only navigation, but in shipbuilding and working with timber and smiting tools in building those vessels which might navigate rivers that haven't been, uh, haven't been shaped so as to be conducive for commerce as we have these days. Well, these were these raw, unfettered rivers that were largely wild that these great plains across Northern Europe, that these rivers flowed across. When you get into those types of rivers, the Arkansas flows by my house, you know, far from here, it's a braided river. It's a, one of the, it's like many rivers that flow across the middle of the country. There are these great big wide expanses that fill up in the springtime, but during the summer and the middle of winter, they're dry. There's lots of sandbars. It's a lot of navigational challenges. You get on over into Arkansas, it's a full deep channel all the way down to the Mississippi. And this is, um, these people had figured out how to navigate that. And there's a lot of story. If you look at the Peterborough petroglyphs in Canada, those petroglyphs go hand in glove with the Iron, Bronze Age, Iron Age petroglyphs in Sweden. You see pictures of Thor wearing one of the great conical hats you see in the Museum of Denmark. Um, you find rune stones, you have conjecture, you have ideas, you have all of these ideas. Um, at that time, That great navigable ocean at that time was navigable, but it wasn't always there. Throughout history, there have been many small ice ages where that sea became very clogged with ice and really not navigable. Uh, when the Vikings began their expeditions in the 700s, we had kind of a warm period. We had a warm time where those sea channels were no longer clogged with ice, so we could invade England, so we could find Iceland, so we could go to Greenland. So we could retrace routes that have already been known. No sailor's just gonna take his boat. Well, I think I'll go that way. Not one time in history has that ever happened. Somebody knew where they were going. Somebody heard tell, somebody had a sign. You need to go here and then you can go here. That's the way it always is. Nobody just jumps out and say, you know what? I'm gonna throw my life to the wind here. And uh, I think I'll go that way. It's not how it ever works. Be that as it may. Then besides the danger of a boisterous and unknown sea who would, re who would relinquish Asia, Africa, or Italy for Germany, a land rude in its surface, rigorous in its climate, cheerless to every beholder and cultivator except native. In their ancient songs, which are only records or annals, they celebrate their god Tuisto, sprung from the earth and his son Manus as the fathers and founders of their race. To Manus they ascribe three sons from whose names the people bordering on the oceans are called Igevones, those inhabiting the central parts, Hermanones, the rest, Istivones, and the rest Istivones. So right there we have these Roman perceptions of the names of our gods. Hmm. And that doesn't mean a lot to us. And it takes a lot to figure it out. So to Isto, the learned Leibniz, I <laughs> even they'd say that. Suppose this Tuisto to have been the Tuat or Tuatates, so famous throughout Gaul and Spain, who was a Celto Scythian king or hero and subdued and civilized a great part of Europe and Asia. Various other conjectures have been formed concerning him and his son Manus, but most of them extremely vague and improbable. Among the rest, it has been thought that in Manus and his three sons, an obscure tradition is preserved. So this is where they try to tie it into Cain, Abel, and Seth or Noah, which is one of the real first clues that we have that he's writing this during that time of transition from these ancient pagan empires to this they're trying to tie it all together see they got to sell this christianity to all these other people some however assuming the license of antiquity antiquity affirm that there were more descendants of the gods from whom more appellations were derived as those of the Marci, the Gambrivi, the Suevi, and the Vandali. So the Marci, 
The Marsi appear to have occupied various portions of the northwest part of Germany at, Germany at various times. In the time of Tiberius, AD 14, they sustained a great slaughter from the forces of Germanicus, who ravaged their country for 50 miles with fire and sword, sparing neither age nor sect, neither things profane nor sacred. At this time, they were occupying the country in the neighborhood of the Ruhr, a tributary of the Rhine. Probably this slaughter was the destruction of them as a separate people. And by the time the Trajan succeeded to the imperial power, they seem to have blotted out, they seem to have been blotted out from amongst the Germanic tribes, hence their name will not be found in the following account of Germany. So the Vandals seem to have derived their name from, from the German word to wander. That's interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> that of Germany, on the other hand, they assert to be a modern addition. For that, the people who first crossed the Rhine and expelled the Gauls and are now called the Tungri were then named Germans, which appellation of a particular tribe, not of a whole people, gradually prevailed, so that the title of Germans, first assumed by the victors in order to excite terror, was afterwards adopted by the nation in general. So this was a particularly violent group of individuals that uh, weren't going to show you any mercy. Such was the way it was. That um, That's how empires all over the world have been built. <laughs> so they also, they have likewise the tradition of a Hercules of their country, whose praises they sing before those of all other heroes as they advance in battle. Well, that's interesting because that's a peculiarly um, that's a peculiar term to put in there. Hercules was such a very much Greek and Roman uh, idea. So under this name, Tacitus speaks of some German deity whose attributes corresponded to the main with those of the, those of the Greek and Roman Hercules. What he was called by the Germans is a matter of doubt. So it could have been any. It could have been Thor. It could have been Tyr. It could have been. It could have been, it could have been any number of, of ancient heroes that we would celebrate. But when we begin to see the influence of these heroes in inspiring these great nations or these tribes to become as great as they want to become. A peculiar kind of verse is also current among them by which the recital of, of by the recital of which termed barding, they stimulate their courage. So we have the ideas of art, that stimulate people to have imaginations of the divine when people portray what they see and they try to, um, they add some aspect of what they hold divine into it. But the barding, that's an interesting term. That is, those are the songs, the stories, the tales that inspire men to want to do great things that make them believe that no matter what happens, whatever the end may be, there will be something great. There will be, I will have achieved something magnificent. I will be remembered, I will be immortal. My children might have a safe place to live. Um, barding is that tradition that that stirs the soul, like any music does. And we have we have a god for that, and that god is supposedly the the son of um, Odin's visit with Gunnlod. His wife is Iduna, who gives the who gives the apples that sustain the life of the gods, who represents some aspects of the earth herself. Um, Bragi is that god that Loki first insults at Eager's feast, calling him a coward. And yet by his words, men are inspired even down into the popular cultures of the, of the various tribes. While the sound itself serves as an augury of the event of the impending combat, for according to the nature of the cry proceeding from the line, terror is inspired or felt, nor does it seem so much an articulate song as the wild chorus of valor. A harsh, piercing note and a broken roar are the favorite tones, while they render more full and sonorous by applying their mouths to their shield. So they're creating a true cacophony of noise meant to instill fear. So it's bolstering courage. It's that great battle cry. Hmm. One more interesting idea of Braggy that he would create such, such, that he would be responsible for creating that that image or that idea or that feeling to string along the passions of men preparing to risk it all with something like that. They call it barding. Hmm. 
It can be done in the courtroom or it can be done on the battlefield. Bragi is a far more important being than we understand. Some conjecture that Ulysses, in the course of his long and fabulous wanderings, was driven into this ocean and landed in Germany, and that Acerburnium, a place situated on the Rhine and at this day inhabited, was founded by him. So the Greeks, it's now Asburg in the county of Mears. Asburg is a uh, <laughs> they pretend that an altar was formerly discovered here, consecrated to Ulysses with the name of his father's Laertes of Join, and that certain monuments and tombs inscribed with Greek characters are still extant upon the confines of Germany and Raetia. These allegations I shall neither attempt to confirm nor to refute. Let everyone believe concerning them as he is disposed. Well, the Greeks, by their means of their colony in Marseille, introduced their letters into Gaul. And the old Gaelic coins have many Greek characters in their inscriptions. The Helvetians, also as we are informed by Caesar, used Greek letters. Hence, they might easily pass by means of commercial intercourse to the neighboring Germans. Count Marsili and others have found monuments with Greek inscriptions in Germany, but not of so early an age. And you really got to consider what was the Etruscan influence in that. We know that the Etruscans were one of the oldest cultures, and much of their alphabet is not deciphered yet. We do know that they made use of the runes, some of the earliest usage of runes that we have come across with the Etruscans, the original inhabitants of Northern Italy. I concur in opinion that those who deem the Germans never to have intermarried with other nations, to be a race pure, unmixed, and stamped with a distinct character. Now, if they're, so you have to bear in mind now, they have a pure, un, a race pure, unmixed, and stamped with distinct character. Most nations do, but not in the Roman Empire not one that had built so much and so grand and so many different cultures invited into its very halls. There was even a temple to an unknown God. They were so afraid of offending the various pagan deities that they worshiped. But even if they were intermarried race, pure, unmixed, and stamped with a distinct character, they would still kill the neighboring tribe in a heartbeat. So, I, you know, that's one of the biggest things that I see with people that talk about pure white ethno state somewhere, somehow, some jackass would be sitting around getting high and you'd have to, you know what, I need to do something to prove who I am. I think I'll go kill that tribe over there. And that's basically how it works out. It doesn't really matter what you create, what situation, what environment you decide to build it in. While it might be most prominently seem to be the simplest solution with which to insulate and protect our children from any number of outside sources, does not always lead to the utopian society that we wish it would. It's a family likeness pervades the whole, though their numbers are, are so great. Eyes stern and blue, ruddy hair, large body, powerful in sudden exertions, but impatient of toil and labor, least of all capable of sustaining thirst and heat. Cold and hunger they are accustomed to by their climate and soil to endure. So he's got kind of a shallow interpretation of right there. So this high ranking upper crust senator or noted person of Roman society is looking at the plebes and passing judgment on them saying, well, he's good for the short burst, but uh, when it comes to toil and working, he probably, he's thinking about them as slaves. He's thinking about them, what good would they really be in this society? Because they can't toil, they're not good in the heat. Well, you have to think about that. They're raised in a landscape that is verdant, covered with hills, full of fish. How much effort do they need to put into in a landscape when all they got to do is go hunting or they got to go fishing? Plant enough crops and enough hay to feed their livestock during the winter. They don't need to plant enough to feed an empire. All they have to do is take care of their tribe. So sure, that's what's going to develop. They're going to develop the strength to handle the tasks they need to handle for a Roman empire. And that's very much kind of the, the attitude that, that, was, that really became prevalent during the industrial, uh, the industrial revolution. We need people that can work for long hours, uninterrupted hours in that factory. Children seem to be good for it, so they'd put children to work in these things. We need them coal miners to work 10, 12, 16 hour day shifts, uh, humping that coal out of there. Well, these great big giant people aren't gonna be very good at it, but what these great Germans did when they settled uh, the, north, the northern central part of the United States, your North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, 
in lands much like where they came from with cold, harsh winters, but verdant landscapes, plenty of hunting, uh, they continue to thrive and succeed. You can get them down to Texas and it, they're sucking wind. Hmm. The land, though varied to a considerable extent by its aspect, is yet universally shagged with forests or deformed by marshes. Forests and marshes hold lots of game and fish. Moisture on the side of Gaul, more bleak on the side of Norinum and Pannonia. It is productive of grain, but unkindly to fruit trees. So that would make the apple pretty special up there, wouldn't it? It abounds in flocks and herds, a verdant countryside full of game, but in general of a small breed. And he must miss the art part about the aurochs and the Irish elk. Even the beef kind are destitute of their usual stateliness and dignity of head. I don't know what that means. They are, however, numerous and form the most esteemed and indeed the only species of wealth. That's the cattle. The cattle of some parts of Germany are at present remarkably large so that their former smallness must have been rather, must have rather been owing to want of care in feeding them and protecting them from the inclemencies of weather and improving the breed by mixtures than to the nature of the climate. Now yeah, that's human nature. We're gonna breed the thing that produces the most results. The beef, he's talking about the beef. And as Fehu suggests that cattle, that wealth, that's money on the hoof. And right here he's telling us that silver and gold, that, that was the only species of wealth. If you had several cattle, you had the means to take care of them. Fehu, wealth, cattle. Not that I would assert that no veins of these metals are generated in Germany, for who has made the search? The possession of them is not coveted by these people as it is by us. Vessels of silver are indeed to be seen among them, and, and many of them are museums now. Great, beautiful conical hats made of gold. Uh, oh my gosh, I can't think of the name of that pot that everybody looks at. Matter of fact, it's on my Facebook page. It's a beautiful silver inlay. It's got a shaman holding a snake. But they're held in no higher estimation than earthenware, and I kind of doubt that. The borderers, however, set a value on gold and silver for the purpose of commerce and have learned to distinguish several kinds of our coin. So the people at the edges of the empire have figured out that these will trade for this gold coinage. It means nothing to them. The remoter inhabitants continue the more simple and ancient usage of bartering commodities. I was discussing this with Sidney Horton today. I talked to her a little bit. We have this resurgence of this faith. But you know what else we have? This kind of petering off of the Industrial Revolution and this bartering economy, such as Lyft and Uber and Amazon, all these things, these, all this bartering economy, this is a, a, many billions of dollars is exchanged through barter these days. You can go online and you can, you can barter some of your garage. You can barter a room in your house. You can, you can trade this, this bartering economy is making a powerful resurgence. And as we see California burn, as we see rolling blackouts across that, there's an opportunity there that I think a really good salesman is gonna figure out. He's gonna figure out these people can file a land patent and remove themselves from the municipality in which they live, and then they can go solar. And they don't have to worry about code enforcement coming by and say, well, I'm about to write down, you can't. I'm not in your municipality. There's a huge market just born for all of these people. Tesla solar shingles are 90% efficient. Yeah, they cost $25,000, but would you rather be self-sufficient, industrious, and rely on upon yourself? Or do you want to continue to rely on someone else and continue to be righteously indignant about the failing of someone else? When we begin to put the control of the success, the comfort of our lives in the hands of others, we really bought into it. We got suffered. We weren't even paying attention. We will see the first essences of the freedom of that kind of self-reliance and industriousness take root in California. Every year it burns. Every year it's somebody else's fault. Quit using that electricity. These people can't figure it out and want to play silly games. Take yourself out of that playing field. Go solar, put a windmill up, drill your water well, get your land patent and be free of it. The bartering economy is coming back hand in glove with the resurgence of this faith, of these ideas that are talked about right here. <laughs> 
The money preferred by the Germans is the old and well-known species known as, as the Serati and the Bugatti. So that's the old and well-known species. Um, as vice and corruption advanced among the Romans, their money became debased and adulterated. Well, sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Thus Pliny relates that Livius Drusus, during his tribuneship, mixed an eighth part of brass with the silver coin, that Antony the triumvir mixed iron with the denarius, and that some coin to base metal, others diminished the pieces, and hence it became an art to prove the goodness of the denarii. One precaution for this purpose was cutting the edges like the teeth of a saw, which means it was seen whether the metal was the same quite through or was only plated. That's why our quarters still have edges on them. They got it from there. These were the serrati or the serrated denarii. The bugatti were those stamped with the figure of a chariot drawn by two horses, as were the quadrigati with the chariot and four horses. These were old coin of purer silver than those of the emperors. Hence the preference of the Germans for certain kinds of species was found on their apprehension of being cheated with false money. I think there's a lot of people feel that way about the Fed. Even iron is not plentiful among them, as may be inferred from the nature of their weapons. Swords or broad lances are seldom used, but they generally carry a spear, called in their language the Crimea, which has an iron blade, short and narrow, but so sharp and manageable that as occasion requires, they employ it either in, cl in close or distant fighting. This spear and shield are the armory, are the armor of all the cavalry. The foot have besides missile weapons, several to each man, which they hurl to an immense distance. They are either naked or lightly covered with a small mantle and have no pride in equipage. Their shields only are ornamented with the choicest colors. Few are provided with a coat of mail and scarcely here and there one with a cask or helmet. Their horses are neither remarkable for beauty or swiftness, nor are they taught the various evolutions practiced with us. The cavalry either bear down straight forwards or wheel once to the right, so compact a body that none is left behind the rest principal strength on the whole consists in their infantry. Hence in engagement, these are intermixed with the cavalry. So well according with the nature of equestrian combat is the agility of these foot soldiers, whom they select from the whole body of their youth and place in the front of the line. Their number two is determined, a hundred from each canton, and they are distinguished at home by a name expressive of their circumstance, so that, that, so that what at first was only an appellation of number becomes henceforth a title of honor. Their line of battle is disposed in wedges. Now, where else do we see that idea of the wedge? Well, that is one of the secrets of combat that Odin, the man on the mountain, imparts to Sigurd when he brings him on to the boat. He teaches him, approach it in a wedge formation, drive right down the middle and split it. That was one of the lessons, like I say, that's one of the lessons that Odin taught Sigurd was the wedge formation. That was the true gift of tactics from Odin himself. And here we have an idea of it. Um, each man has several, the whole idea of what they're talking about here, this is your basic infantry. And while it might seem simple enough and can be dismissed as unimportant, what you have to remember is that Herman used all of that stuff right there to defeat the Romans. And that at Augsburg, um, they also defeated the Romans. They made a great offering and held a celebration on September of 28th of every year, the anniversary of the victory of the battle to T Tyr's partner, Zisa. So we have kind of a glossing over of what they're truly capable of. These men, we got to remember, while they might not be good on the long haul, toiling a field all day long, if you grab a hold of one of them, you're going to have a tussle. He's going to throw several stones and a spear, which he's probably pretty good at, before you even get to him. And then when you get to him, this joker, he's not really worried about his safety. He's going to break your neck. Or he's going to row a boat all day. And then when he gets off, he's going to be singing a song talking about ripping your head off. So when we look at that, we've got to understand 
he's looking at this from a position of power. He's looking at this from a position of man that's never been in the trenches. Your regular Roman centurion might have a much different concern here <laughs> than just what Tacitus is writing about. And these were strong men, right? These were not, they may not, and their horses were, may not be for beauty or swiftness. They may not have the evolutions practiced with us, the, the patterns of warfare that the Romans used with great success all over the world and the known world at that time. Um, they didn't care about it. They will grab that horse by the neck, bite it on its ear, and take it down. For those of you who don't know, if a horse gets all carried away in the, in the, in the stock, in, the, in your pen there, and he's kicking and bucking, you're trying to put a saddle on him, um, reach your arm around his neck, grab up there and bite him on there, and he'll settle right down. I've seen my dad do it, and I had to do it a couple times too. It's not pleasant, but it does work. <laughs> to give ground, provided they rally again, it's, it's considered rather as a prudent stratagem than cowardice. So they will rope-a-dope you. They will call you in, regroup, and whoop your ass. They carry off their slain even while the battle remains undecided. The greatest distance that can befell them is to have abandoned their shields. The greatest disgrace that can befall them is to have abandoned their shields. And that's cowardice. And that's, that's where the priests begin to offer punishment. That's where the stripes come from. When you are convicted of cowardice on the battlefield, that's where the Gothi steps in and administers the stripes. That's typically where you'll be outlawed because you're of no use to the tribe at that point. A person branded with this ignominy is, is not permitted to join in their religious rites or enter their assemblies so that many, after escaping from battle, have put an end to their infamy by the halter. That means they've hung themselves. So if you're in battle and you lose, then basically what this is, is a loss of faith. See, that's, there's a lot of what they talk about here is to bolster a man's confidence, the Valkyrie, the woman to escort the slain on the battlefield to Valhalla. So there's hope for a soldier that even though he gives it his all and comes up short, there's something very special for him. There's a real powerful connection between life and death that goes with this idea of the warrior mentality. And that warrior mentality is meant only for a stage of a man's life. And he gets that number, and that number will have honor on it from there on out. People, and he doesn't give himself that honor. Others give him that honor. Others hold that number in high esteem. Others hold that name in high esteem. That's where honor, when you walk across the stage after you graduated college, you graduate with honors. Someone gives that to you. I don't sit around and say, well, I've done the honorable thing. Who the hell am I to say I've done the honorable thing? There's 10 people over here that might say that was pretty shitty. So we got to pay attention to that quite a bit. But they, they carry off their slain from the battlefield even before it's undecided. Is there something special to occur there? Um, but after they, if they do fail, if they are branded with the ignominy, they are not permitted to join in the religious rites or enter their assemblies. They're not even allowed to come into those areas. So there's something very special in the divine that if you've lost faith, who are you to come in here? There's no forgiveness in this. You do the right thing each time, every time, all the time. And I'm telling you, if you can even begin to apply a tenth of that concept to what you're doing in this life, everything changes. Everything changes. Do the right thing each time, every time, all the time. There's no telling what your life will look like. Even if you think you're going to fail, do the right thing. Stand up and take it like a man. <laughs> because those people that fail to do that, our ancestors, well, they weren't worthy to stand and bloat. So you have to ask yourself when somebody says, well, I stand before my gods. I say, have you done all of those things necessary to earn that right? Because I'm looking at this right here saying there are some cases that you don't get to do that. In the election of kings, they have regard to birth and that of generals. So, in the election of kings, they have regard to birth. You're born into it. In that of generals, to valor. You earn it. Their kings have not an absolute or unlimited authority, and their generals command less 
through the force of authority than of example. So they led by example. Nobody's going to follow a coward into battle. And if you're born into a kingship, you have to remember that while there was always a chieftain and the other side of that spectrum, there was always a gofi. There was always the division of power. That's where the concept of the division of power came from with Thomas Jefferson understanding and reading about Anglo-Saxon civilizations and all of these ancient chieftains. And that's where this division of power come from. Um, <laughs> and there were a lot of reasons for it, but the original concept originated from these tribes of Northern Europe. The king may have been born into it, but there was a gothi there saying, wait a minute now, because they're the ones that administered punishment, not the king. It was the gothi. The Gothi received annual tribute. The Gothi made sure that there was a, the king made sure that there was funds for a hall. The Gothi received funds to make sure that the hall was taken care of, uh, that there was annual feasts and everything else. And then they did their best to weave into, with a king or chieftain, the kind of framework for a person to live a life where he was assured that if he did the right thing each time, every time, all the time, that he would have a comfortable position in that society, in that tribe. He would be secure in who he was. He wouldn't need to reach out for some righteously indignant idea to make sure that he felt important. He would have what it takes all the time to do what it takes to protect something very special and sacred. Their lives were interwoven with the ideas of community, tribe, and spirituality. They, and it seemed to work for a long time. <laughs> if they are daring, this is speaking of the generals, if they are daring, adventurous, and conspicuous in action, they procure obedience from the admiration they inspire. What a, that's an awesome thing. None, however, but the priests are permitted to judge offenders, to inflict bonds or stripes, so that chastisement appears not as an act of military discipline, but as the instigation of the God with whom they suppose present with warriors. They also carry with them to battle certain images and standards taken from the sacred groves. So even their ideas of warfare were woven into the ideas of the divine. There's something spiritual, even in the act of competition for life and death. It's a gamble. And if you have luck on your side, who's to say what you're going to win? If you have a God on your side because you've done the right thing, because you've successfully woven the two together, now all of a sudden we're talking about something much different, something much grander, something, and how could you be a coward in that? How could you be cowardly in that kind of atmosphere? I'll tell you why, because they're not distracted by some other kind of nonsense. That's one way. It is a principal incentive to their courage that their squadrons and battalions are not formed by men fortuitously collected, but by the assemblage of families and clans. So then I just go through and pick everybody. And this is kind of a slight on the Roman Empire instead of the Germanic tribes, is that the, German, the Roman Empire, well, we're going to take all these men and we're going to train them and we're going to make them into something. We're going to build a spree de corps and we're going to build a shield wall and blah, blah, blah. When you get a group of families and clans, they're going to fight for love of each other. They're fighting for something much more powerful than the Roman Empire could, is they're beginning to lose grasp of that concept. There's no powerfully motivating figure at the time that he's writing this. You have Nero fiction to come to power and Rome's going to burn. Well, those loyalties go out the damn door when your bank is on fire. That's when your family and clan gets together. Well, we ain't done it in 50 years. We don't know what to do. The Germans didn't lose track of that. Their pledges also are near at hand. They have within hearing the yells of their women and the cries of their children. These two are the most revered witnesses of each man's conduct. These his most liberal applauders. To their mothers and their wives, they bring their wounds for relief. Nor do these dread to count or to search out the gashes. The women also administer food and encouragement to those who are fighting. How many men would fight how much harder if they knew their wife and child was in danger? What depths do you think you could dig down to to win if you thought your wife would be sold into slavery or your children sold into slavery? My gosh, you have a family of 20 men out there. I wouldn't want to throw 100 at them if that was the case. Tradition relates that armies beginning to give way have been rallied by the females through the earnestness of their supplications. 
and the interposition of their bodies in the pictures they have drawn of impending slavery, a calamity which these people bear with more impatience for their women than themselves. So that those states who have been obliged to give among their hostages the daughters of noble families are the most effectually bound to fidelity. They even suppose somewhat of sanctity and prescience to be inherent in the female sex and therefore neither despise their counsels nor disregard their responses. So they hold them in a special position. They may not necessarily be their equal on the battlefield, but that doesn't mean that their opinion isn't vitally important to the success of that tribe. They're gonna think about something we may have missed, we may have forgot, we may not have understood. And that was, that's been part of their culture for a long time. Is it a part of ours now? So when we talk about finding a partner in life, these are the kind of things we should be looking at. And I sometimes don't think we do. So these men are out there giving 110%. These women are also out there giving 110%. They're treating the wound. They're offering liberal applause for the success of their men, encouraging him. Tradition relates that armies beginning to give way have been rallied by the females through the earnestness of their supplication and the interposition of their bodies. They got in their way and they showed them their tits and said, listen here, you want this, blah, blah, blah. So there's something important in that. These men steeled themselves, turned around and went back and won. They even supposed, anyway, we have beheld in the reign of Vespasian, Veleda, long referenced by many as a deity. Armina, moreover, and several others were formerly held in equal veneration, but not with servile flattery, nor as though they made them goddesses. So Veleda, she was taken prisoner by um, Vitalius Gallicus, and Vid Vidrathus was a goddess of the Tungri, Haramela, another provincial deity, whose names were found, at, found by Mr. Penna inscribed on altars at the Roman station at Burns. They were erected by the German auxiliaries. Uh, by the, that's in Scotland, I believe it is. And that's something else we have to remember that this blanket discussion of all of these tribes of Germania may not necessarily have held true for all of them, um, but it ain't far off the mark. Of the gods, Mercury, they're talking about Odin, is the principal object of their adoration, whom on certain days they think it lawful to procreate even with human sacrifices, Odin's day. To Heracles, Hercules and Mars, they offer the animals usually a lot of sacrifice. So Hercules and Mars, we're probably talking about Thor and, uh, no, we're not talking about Thor. A deity whose attributes this appears not, this appears to have not been Thor, who is rather the representative of the Roman Jupiter, but Tyr, a warrior god and the protector of the champions and brave men. From Tyr is derived the name given the third day of each week. Some of the Suevi also performed sacred rites to Isis, and that most likely was Freya. What was the cause and origin of this foreign worship? I have not been able to discover. For, further, that her being represented with the symbol of a galley seems to indicate an important religion. Now that's probably Zisa. That's Zisa there. The Suebi worship in Zisa because Zisa symbol was the was the, the light light Roman worship that could travel on the rivers. And you'll see it sometimes on the petroglyphs. It's just a small boat with some rows, and there'll be a solar cross on the mast. That's the symbol of Zeus herself. <laughs> they conceive it unworthy the grandeur of celestial beings to confine their deities within walls or to represent them under a human similitude. Woods and groves are their temples and they affix names of divinity to that secret power which they behold with the eye of adoration alone. So there's two things that we need to consider about that and two things that are they're really kind of shit on in the prose edda. They conceive it unworthy the grandeur of celestial beings to confine their deities within walls or to represent them under a human similitude. So when they're talking about that, you had to think about Loki at Eager's Feast. And I pointed this out in my book, Hell, the Sun Facing Goddess. It is at Eager's Feast that we have the most powerful representation of an attempt to humanize the divine. 
as Loki is the uninspired human intellect, does his level best to bring down these divine beings to terms that we can relate to, that we can denigrate, that we can ask questions of. But it really is a complete misunderstanding of how the divine interacts with each other. But he brings it down just enough to humanize it and tell and shows us what our future will be. We'll be bound by the guts of our own children because we fail to hold divine what is divine. And I think it's an awfully powerful thing to say, but I think it's the truth. And then when the woods and groves are their temples and they affix names of divinity to that secret power, which they behold with the eye of adoration alone. So when you're talking about the eye of adoration alone, you're talking about those beautiful visions that we see when we walk through the woods. How many people have you seen talk about, well, I went for a walk in the woods and I was recharged. Well, okay, why? Well, now we're being told that our ancient ancestors have fixed names of divinity to that secret power, which they behold with the eye of adoration alone, a beautiful sunset on the ocean, a beautiful sunrise over the fields. All of these things are a part of the telling of time for one. But they're also a part of the divine interacting with this world, creating an environment where we might thrive and survive and become what we're supposed to become. That's a real interesting thing to consider. They're not confined. They're not humanized. And they're not limited in their scope. And all of these things are things that we contend with today. When you see people talking about, I stand before my God, you're talking about, well, I was sitting on the drink. I was having a drink with good buddy Thor in my mom's basement on the couch. Or we get lost in looking at the etymologies and many other things. But we forget that, as it is said when we were talking about the priest earlier, all of their life is intertwined with the divine. Not because of some righteously indignant idea that might motivate me to understand how special, how I might really be a victim and I just don't know it. What it's telling me is that none of that shit really mattered. None of these people were looking for some kind of savior. They all had, be it a political Jesus or otherwise, they saw the world that they lived in. They did not confine the divinities to certain ideas that our human mind always has limits. It's only going to be able to perceive a fraction of what the divine might truly be. We can only see a portion of the heavens. What makes us think we could see all of the gods or confine them to a building? We integrate it into our lives and we become a fine expression of that divinity. There's the real magic that everyone's looking for. And we find hints about what that should look like, how that should feel as we journey through these woods, as we pay attention to the verdant landscapes full of life, these flows of energy that go across the world that we're very much a part of. When we separate ourselves from that, that's when we begin to feel pain. That's when we begin to seek out those things that make us feel ah, empowered, angry, because it's socially acceptable to be angry, isn't it? It's not socially acceptable to be spiritually lost or to feel pain or to not know what to do with it. Nobody has an image of what it means to come back from that, do they? And we are all trying to figure that out. No people are more addicted to divination by lots and omens and lots. If you're tied into everything you live, everything around you is tied into the divine and the spiritual, the idea of a divination by omen and lots, well, that's simply reading those messages. Now we're talking about casting runes. Now we're talking about understanding, utilizing some of those powers to change our thoughts and change our reality. The latter is performed in this simple manner. They cut a twig from a fruit tree, okay, and divide it into small pieces, which distinguished by certain marks are thrown promiscuously upon a white garment. Then the priest of the canton, if the occasion be public, if private, the master of the family, after an invocation to the gods, with his eyes lifted up to heaven, thrice takes out each piece, and as they come up, interprets their significance, signification according to the marks fixed upon them. That is how you pull a rune. That, where it comes from, how you do it, they cut a twig from a fruit tree, fruit tree, and divide it into small pieces. 
mark the runes on them. You can put you can blood them if you'd like to. Um, raise your eyes to heaven, invoke a god, throw them promiscuously upon a white garment, and pick three. That's how you pull a rune. Not with a damn card, not with a flashy thing on social media, not with some stone you bought online. Find a fruit tree, cut you some slivers off of it, mark them, and now make your invocation to your God, and now pull three. That's how you pull the runes. That's how you understand how well, how well you have successfully integrated your life into this divine aspect that we today call also true, true to the old gods. So it's 8.40 right now. We've been talking for about an hour. I feel like we did pretty good stuff here. I'll finish this up. Well, I'll keep working on it next week, and we'll see if we can get through it. But I think when we begin to look at that, we begin to decipher it with some of the things we know now, I think we begin to see some things that are really amazing that are happening with regards to our faith and our spirituality. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to talk about them now. Go ahead and unmute everybody. Hello. Thank you for doing that, though. I haven't, uh, um, I haven't read that book. I haven't read his stuff. What? So, I know, I know. You're blaspheming here. I have <laughs> So, you know, sometimes there's so many books, you just get a little behind on what you're reading. <laughs> so, I, no, I appreciate that. That's awesome. That is an important book, ma'am. Well, and I think, too, I, I probably haven't prioritized it because everybody always says it's so intimidating and it's just hard to read. And I, that doesn't sound like it was hard to read, though. So I'm like, oh, there's hope here. I could read this. <laughs> no, shit. <laughs> it is a good book man it offers a lot of insight into into everything we're trying to do but i, I i've read it several times and i think it's uh because it's a good source material it's good uh there's a lot of good reference in there and you know we're really none of those bastards in there talking about the etymology of anything i mean he gets the gods confused a little bit <laughs> but i think the characteristics are are really important you know mercury he confuses with Odin uh, because Mer o Mercury is the one that travels the realms. Merc you know, and then Zeus and uh, Jupiter and Thor, I mean, those are the ones that hurl the lightning bolts. Uh, interesting that, that the one that would travel the realms is the most prominent of the gods among us, while the ones who hurl the lightning bolts are the most prominent. So you see power, and then you see kind of uh, as, as a, as a, you see raw unfettered power as a as a primary idea among the greeks and romans but when you get to the germanic tribes <laughs> odin i.e mercury the one who can travel the realms who carries these messages um who, un who understands these languages there's there's an interesting idea there that that helps us understand something about the nature of the afterlife then it's going to be, it bears further study. It's probably going to be, I'm going to, it's, it's, it's caught my eye several times. Um, Slightly, there's probably a spider anyway. At any rate, I digress. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions over what is typically a fairly dry subject? No? Okay. Unmute some, these, unmute some of these people. Oh, you got them all muted. Well, they can unmute. I just didn't unmute them just in case they had noise going on in their own home. <laughs> yeah, I kept myself muted, Brian. Uh, it's it's an interesting read. Uh, I'm going to have to read on and keep up with you guys. But I was actually glad to be able to follow along and Melissa uh, thank you so much for helping me find that uh, when you first started out I was really confused because uh, the the texts that I was 
following along, it didn't sound like what you were starting with until you actually started reading it. And then I was like, okay, yeah, this is the right one. Because I started reading a little bit on it. And then mm-hmm. when I heard you start that, I was like, okay, yeah, so it's this one. You got to remember, I, I stop in the middle of sentences too, and I'll find the footnotes and try to offer some explanation on it as well. Yeah, I noticed that as well. Uh, when you were doing that, I was kind of like uh, through a couple of them until I actually realized I was like, well, where is he getting this part of it? You know, I mean, is he just uh, is he just uh, summarizing what he's read or is, is there another book that he's reading from? But then I noticed that there was footnotes in there and I started yeah. to try to follow along there, too. You know, Will, Will brings up a point. The difference also points to the depths of the racial soul of Germanic peoples. He says it points to the depth of the racial soul of Germanic peoples in comparison to the Greco-Roman. And I think that's an interesting, it's, it's interesting to watch that develop because what happens in the Greco-Roman is you eventually end up with a, with a faith or a spirit or a religion that allows them to control a much larger, much more vast empire that does have several different types of people in it. It does have several different races in it. And how do you control an empire that large? You can't militarily keep enough people in place to keep everybody at the tip of the sword. You've got to embrace a spirituality. And this is one of Constantine's, I mean, I'm, it obviously costs us a lot, but if you think about it from an emperor's point of view, if you think about it from Constantine or Theodosius's point of view, who actually made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, you find and you find a tactical stroke of genius. And the same thing for Peter the Great in the Russian Empire with the Russian Orthodox Church. That is a vast empire. You can't control that many people. So the Germans hadn't plagued themselves with that kind of problem. They hadn't brought a problem to their doorstep that needed to have that kind of solution. Whereas your Roman Empire and your Russian Empire and your Persian empires, they brought to their own doorstep a problem that they had to contend with. That being, how do I control this empire? I got out here like John Wayne, whooped everybody's ass, now it's mine. Well, shit, now what do I do? Now I got to figure out how to keep all these people in check. I know what, we'll tell them all they're equal. We'll give them uh, some mythological figure to believe in that has conquered death. And I got it. I got it. It's still around today. And we're sitting here trying to figure out in these vast, in a world of 7 billion people, how to create that same kind of idea. And I think that we, we, we plague ourselves with the problem when we try to say, well, it all really needs to be kind of this way. Well, other people have a right to be wrong. So when we eliminate that idea, um, when you eliminate those outward pressures, it becomes real simple to stick with people you know and like. It's, you know what I mean? And so I think we're, we're beginning to figure that out slowly but surely. Because that, the, 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 the idea of race, it's only going to get us so far. It only ever gets us so far. And I'm beginning to think that as we make ourselves into the hammer instead of just carrying the hammer, I think that some of these things fall into place of their own accord. Because that's when we can, you know, we can... We've got to do it. We, Steve McNallan told me a long time ago, we were at uh, Camp Norgay. I think it was, uh, it was when Mark felt, it was when Mark figured out he first had cancer. What was that, 2013, Heather? Or 2012? At Camp Norgay? That, where Jeffrey got lost and he I had to. <laughs> um, Steve said at a, a leadership meeting there, we were all sitting there and he said, we cannot, we cannot afford to surrender the semantic high ground. And I think every time we, we misunderstand the problems we plague ourselves with, I think we just hand it over to them. We just hand it over to them and neatly put ourselves in a box to be ignored. And I think trying to compare apples to oranges is a part of the problem. I think when we continue to try to, try to build what we want to build in the same manner that we are accustomed to, 
I think we really shortchange ourselves in the ability to develop. I think that re tribal aspect really has a lot of powerful congruence in it that allows us to build what we want to build without getting sucked into so much other nonsense that really has nothing to do with us. Like what is the limit? I think there's like the limit of what people can, can deal with on a personal level of friendship. It's something like 150 people, about all we can deal with. I mean, you can't possibly imagine what it's like. I mean, for it to be in, 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 in some of these, like Steve, how many, I know he gets hundreds of calls a day, you know, for just nonsense. Mostly people seeking validation saying, hey, why don't you buy into this nonsense that I'm trying to peddle so I'll be more important. And it's typically what he gets, so, and I get it, and everybody else. But <laughs> there's a there's a lot to that when we when we start to think about it. We we can't afford to plague ourselves with the problems that the Romans and the Greeks and the Russians uh, plagued themselves with when they were trying to build great empires. We've got to refocus and start from the ground up with our families and our communities and our tribes. I think for a long time, that was the greatest defense as we begin to step out of the industrial revolution for some, the, some good that it has done us and enter this bartering economy. I think there's a real potential there to, you know, honestly, we've got to move the goalpost. We can't keep trying to kick at that same field goal that's not giving us the winning score. And I, and I see us keep doing that again and again and again. And we're, we're playing two very different games. I think Tastas points that out pretty well. Heather, what are you doing? You've, uh, your audio is not on. I know you're, you're working your butt off, ain't you? <laughs> I can't hear you. Nope. There you go. Nope. Still nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we broke Heather. We broke Heather. <laughs> we broke it. <laughs> She's tired. I'll leave her alone. I know you're working your butt off. Thanks to go on vacation, Australia. Go on tour. <laughs> All right. So if nobody has anything else, I'm 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 gonna wrap it up. It's nine o'clock. I gotta I'm not used to this. They changed the time on me and I'm lost. All right, Brian. It's good to uh it's good to hear from you again, man. I'll see you it's guys. Next week. You. Oh my gosh, our people from South America didn't show up because they